this is session three. Are you in the right session? Okay. Then we'll begin this session. I declare the session open. I'm a s i l Kim, professor of economics at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. And I'm going to be a moderator of this session. I'm greatly honored and privileged for moderating a session in Global HR Forum 2010. Uh, before we start the session, uh, I'll explain the theme of uh, this Global Forum and the theme of our session first. Our uh, open and ready for tomorrow is the main theme of the Global HR Forum 2010. The theme of track C is human resource development and strategies for future labor market demand. This morning in track C, there were two discussion sessions. The first discussion session uh, discussed about career and technical education as the alternative pathway to, ses- to success. And the second session of the track C, the theme was uh, vocational education and training for green growth. Now, in the third section of track C, we are going to deal with the subject, improving skills development for aging population. The Global HR Forum invited excellent expertise in this field for us, and we are privileged to hear from them. I hope throughout the discussion, the problems associated with the aging population in current and in the future market would be analyzed thoroughly, and politics and strategies for improving skills and workability of aging population would come up. Now I'll introduce briefly the speakers and discussants. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers first. Uh, The order is uh, from my left. Okay, order is in the sitting positions, okay. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Christine evans Clark. Uh, please welcome her with a big hand. Okay, yeah. Uh, Dr. evans Clark is Director of the Skills and Employment Department of ILO. She got her PhD from Boston University and has been working for the ILO since 1995. She has many publications on employment and enterprises restructuring. Fortunately, I have received a book of her publication, one of her publications this afternoon. And now I'll introduce Dr. Nam c h a l i Please welcome him. Uh, Dr. Lee is a research fellow at the Korean Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training. He got his PhD in economics from the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Lee's main field of research is labor market analysis and human resources development. And he has published many articles in international journals. Now, I'll introduce two discussants of this session. Uh, first, Dr. h y u n j u n g c h e o n Dr. c h e o n is a professor of economics at Dongseo University in Busan. He received his PhD in economics in, at the university of Paris One. He has been working as an ad- advisor member of Busan City and Korean American Economic Development Center. Lastly, I'll introduce Professor k i s o n g Lee to you. Please welcome him. Um. 
Professor Lee is professor of Graduate School of Education and Department of Lifelong Education at Sungshil University in Seoul. He got his PhD in education from University of Minnesota. His current research interests are lifelong vocational education and training and international human resource development. Before we start the presentation and discussion, I would like to mention about the allocation of time. I think the major function of the moderator is managing the time effectively. So I, I'm going to, we, we are going to have 80 minutes in total for this session. So in terms of timing, our goal is to finish by 2.20. Each speaker, each speaker will be given 20 minutes for presentation, and each discussant will have 10 minutes for discussion. After presentation, the floor will be open for discussion. At the floor, you can ask questions in Korean and English, because both way trans, uh, transfer, <coughs> translation will be is served. Now we are going to invite Dr. Evans Clark for presentation of her paper. Please welcome her with a big hand. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for that warm reception. I'm very happy to be among the speakers for this event. Um, in the ILO, we have been um, learning from Korean experience in many ways. We've had studies done this year on uh, what you're doing on skills for green jobs and uh, overall skills development strategy. So it's a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to learn a little bit more about your policies uh, looking at older workers. Um, what I would like to do this, this afternoon is first of all to give you a very brief introduction about what the ILO is doing in terms of skills development. What is our overall strategy? This is the necessary context to look at skills development for older workers. Second, I'd like to summarize very briefly uh, the demographic trends that we're talking about today, about aging societies. And then I'd like to apply our strategy about skills development to this particular challenge about aging societies and look at several ways um, that we find that countries are dealing with this effectively. So first of all, for the skills development strategy, um, I'm not sure how much uh, awareness you have of, of the ILO, so I'd like to start by telling you what our agenda is. We are a United Nations organization. The term UN does not appear in our name because we came first, about 30 years before the United Nations was established. But our mandate within the UN system is to work on labor and employment. And our goal is to promote decent work. So decent work is productive in conditions of safety and dignity and with voice and social security. Decent work is also our work agenda in terms of looking at employment promotion combined with labor standards, social protection, and social dialogue, that these are the four main ingredients that are necessary for decent work, for work that is productive and that leads out of poverty. And finally, decent work is our advocacy within the UN system and among international organizations to keep employment at the heart of development strategies and of macroeconomic policies, that good employment is not what comes after the rest, it is what should lead economies in determining their economic and social policies. The skills development strategy of the ILO starts by looking at what is for many countries a very vicious circle, where most people do not have opportunities to gain a good education, do not have opportunities for training, and are trapped in low productive, low wage jobs. The fact that there is low human capital becomes a disincentive for investors 
foreign and domestic to invest in new technologies, thereby limiting job growth. That's the vicious circle. Instead, what we want to promote is a virtuous circle, where more and better jobs make it easier for companies to innovate, to adopt new technologies, to enter new markets, and to diversify the economy. This is what creates the jobs. So we see that skills development can also be a driver of growth and of change, and this is certainly the example that we feel Korea has set in the world. The ILO's objectives then are to look at skills development for improving employability of workers, the competitiveness and productivity of enterprises, and the social inclusion of growth. We looked at countries that have been successful in sustaining this virtuous circle, and we saw that they followed development policies that served four objectives simultaneously. The first was to match demand and supply in skills development, to lead with what are the jobs, and to use that to determine what should be the training. But secondly, it was to enable workers to continue to learn, because this labor market will always change, and technologies will change. And so workers need to be flexible to be able to learn new skills, and this in turn is what helps enterprises become productive. But we also look at it in a long-term perspective, that skills is a way of driving development, of encouraging investment and technological catching up and then technological innovation. We also saw that countries that had a broad base for education and training, not for the few, but for the many, that they were the ones that had the depth of skills development to spur development. However, it's important, as we have noted in several times throughout this forum, that skills is not the silver bullet. Skills development without a policy to create more jobs is not going to have the benefit of training that we're all looking for. So this is the overview of the skills development strategy of the ILO. Now I'd like to present a little bit about the demographic challenge. Last year, um, in the middle of the financial and then employment crisis, the ILO was asked by the G20 to develop a training strategy, not just for crisis response, but to prepare economies for the growth that was to come after the crisis. And when we did this, we identified six major drivers of change that countries needed to be prepared for and needed to target their skills development towards meeting. And the first one of these is the demographic challenge. Um, on this, we looked first at the aging population, that in 2000, there were almost about half a billion people over the age of 60. By 2050, in just 40 years, this is expected to increase fourfold. So we see a much larger proportion of populations living longer, having longer retirements, and we see that this also has a gender face to it. Because while women compose 55% of the overall population in general, women over the age of 80 are half. Are, are, there are four times as many women in that age bracket as men. So if women who are living longer do not have access to skills and employment throughout their careers, they are the ones most in danger of poverty in their older years. This shows a population change by major region. Of course, here in Asia, we have the largest population of any region, and so stands to reason that this is where we are going to have the far majority of people over the age of 60. What does this mean for demographics? The, the fact that people are living longer and the fact of lower fertility means that the dependency ratios are increasing. For developed countries, and many countries here in Asia, Japan, and China, Korea, the number of persons of working age that are available to support each person over the age of 65 is going to change dramatically. Whereas now there are about 10 or 11 people of working age to support every person over the age of 60. 
By 2050, that number is only going to be four. So this is going to create numerous changes in the labor market, shortages of labor, challenges for pensions and old age security, difficulties in maintaining productivity of workers longer. But we cannot talk about older workers and not also talk about younger workers, which is the uh, focus of the next panel this afternoon. Um, the ILO has just published its, its uh, trends of youth employment, and it found that today, more than ever before, we have a higher percentage of young people who are unemployed. This is the 15 to 24-year-olds. Unemployment is still climbing. In good times, youth unemployment is typically double the rate for adults, as we know, but in recessions, as the OECD countries are facing now, the youth unemployment rate is skyrocketing. However, to be unemployed in the statistics, you have have to be looking for a job or have had a job. The scarier statistic is that one out of every two young people are classified as inactive. That means they're not in school, they're not in training, and they're not employed. This is an enormous risk for countries' future, of productivity, of growth, and for social conflict. And so the things that we are talking about in terms of improving employability of older workers, we need to take into account the challenges that countries are also facing in terms of youth employment. So how can our strategy of decent work, of looking at labor market matching and about anticipating the future, be applied to dealing with the problem, or the challenge rather, of aging economies? We see three major implications for skills and training. The first is that economic growth is going to depend on productivity growth. That as workers are aging, if they lose skills that are useful in the labor market, if they lose productivity, then this is going to have a huge negative effect on economies. Second, we're going to see labor shortages that are going to create demand for higher labor force participation. So the challenge is how to keep older workers active longer and also to have policies that deal with migration. And finally, we see that if we're looking at older workers, we cannot ignore gender issues and disability in that age bracket and deal with the productivity and the equity challenges that that presents. This is the uh, picture about productivity across regions. We know that there's a great deal of diversity among countries within each region. But this shows very clearly in the green bars, the vertical bars, that developed countries still have by far the highest levels of productivity. That's output per worker adjusted for cost of living. However, if we compare where is productivity growing, then we see the economies of East Asia at the highest growth rate, of 7.7% a year, followed by South Asia and Southeast Asia and Central Eastern Europe. These are the countries where productivity is growing the fastest and therefore has the potential to bring up average productivity, which is linked to wages and living standards for others. But it shows also that if we leave behind young workers and older workers, we are going to have a great deal of trouble catching up in terms of productivity rates. Policies to keep older workers productively engaged in the world of work. The first, um, the first element of this strategy is about training, of course. It's retraining to help older workers move from industries or occupations with declining productivity to those areas of the economy that are growing and have higher productivity rates. It's about upgrading skills so that older workers can keep up with new technologies within a job or an occupation. Those of us who are now close to or in the category of older workers are constantly humiliated by our young children who know more about technologies than we do, and we feel very keenly this challenge of the obsolescence of our skills but we know from experience that if older workers are not discriminated against, if they have the same opportunities to continue learning, to pursue lifelong training, 
that they are just as capable of learning new skills. We also need to look at the advantage of having a workforce that combines older workers and younger workers, where older workers are there to mentor younger ones, not just in technologies, but in all of the core skills of communication, teamwork, decision making, good judgment. We need to have this combination in our workplace. And the last bullet point there is not really about training older workers. It's just to recognize that one of the features of aging societies is that there is increasing demand for many occupations in the care industries. And this is creating new opportunities for younger workers if they also can have the right skills to meet those demands. The second element of this strategy is about employment services, because we know that training in and of itself is not enough to keep older workers, or indeed any workers, linked to the labor market. We need to have labor market information. We need to have job matching services. We need to provide counseling and guidance to older workers, the same as we recognize is needed for younger workers to understand the changes in the labor market and what opportunities exist. Many of the countries that have very effective employment services are using those to combine programs that deal with training, job matching, job placement, social protection for older workers. And I've listed just a few of those that I don't have time to really go into, but these are some of the examples that we're following that seem to present good practice of combining these elements of training and services. Many of these programs target specific categories of older workers, in particularly those who were disadvantaged in their younger years, did not have opportunity for good education, find themselves at increasing disadvantage in the labor market. Many of these programs combine community-based approaches with national approaches. What kinds of jobs are available in older older persons' communities. Some of this is even in volunteer expertise, as well as paid jobs. We also see that one of the success factors is to work directly with employers and to help them appreciate their older workers and to keep them in the labor market. The third pillar of this strategy has got to be about combating discrimination. However successful we are in looking at productivity, labor shortages, economic rationales for helping maintain employability of older workers, we have to recognize that in many societies there is discrimination. One myth is that older workers have more difficulty learning. But we have seen that when employers and communities target training to older workers, that they are just as able to learn new skills as anybody else. A second myth that we often confront from employers is that they don't want to invest in on-the-job training because they think that older workers will leave and they won't have enough time to recoup that investment spent on training. But what our studies show is that if you measure tenure, how long workers stay at their employer after training, that we find that older workers have just as long as younger workers because older workers tend to stay with their employers longer, whereas younger people are more apt to leave. So these are just two of the myths that we can find empirical evidence and use to help persuade employers to continue training older workers. But there is also a need to have discrimination, anti-discrimination policies. Um, and way back in 1980, the ILO's tripartite partners, which means governments, usually ministries of labor, trade unions, and employers associations, uh, they are the ones who set our policies and labor standards. And they agreed on a recommendation on older workers to combat discrimination. A recommendation sets out good practices. It sets out menus of policies that other countries might like to pursue and to learn from. It's not a matter of a legal requirement. It's a matter of advocacy and setting out good practices and knowledge sharing. And these are some of the particular things that countries found were effective in combating discrimination and being able to keep older workers productively engaged in the labor market. 
We also need to consider that not all older workers are going to work forever, that countries do need social security and old age pensions. We need to look at the challenge of keeping older workers in the labor market as part of a set of policies that deal with demographic trends and social security. To keep older workers productively engaged requires the same kind of policies on the demand side of the labor market. When we talk about training, as we have been doing these two days, and human resource development, we have to remember that training is not only a supply side activity in the labor market. It takes just as much to understand what is the demand side of the economy doing and to have policies that encourage employers to utilize skills, to have a business strategy that is based on improving productivity rather than on lower wages and a race to the bottom. So we see that extending productive work is really not a substitute for effective old age pensions and social security. We know that in many countries there seems to be a trade-off between creating jobs for young people and keeping older workers in jobs. But when we look at the kinds of jobs older workers are leaving, industries that are perhaps not the ones who are growing, in places where the growth is not centered, we don't see such a one-to-one -one trade off that employees that are older, when they leave, those are not the same kinds of jobs that younger people will be taking. They will have new technologies and be entering new industries. As many countries in Europe in previous recessions tried to encourage retirement of older workers when there were lean times and tried to use this as part of their policies to improve employment for younger and middle-aged workers. And we see very uh, small returns to some of those policies at very high costs in terms of payments to older workers to leave early. And we also see the challenges in the social security systems. This is uh, what we see on the news now in France every day of the effort to, to stabilize old age pensions and social security by increasing the age of retirement or of mandatory retirement. Um, we can see that there is going to be a trade-off if we encourage workers to leave early in order to create opportunities for younger workers, then all of us have to pay even more for longer retirements of older workers. And so this is not an easy trade-off to make, and it requires a great deal of social dialogue to engage all sectors of society in making those hard decisions. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing about um, the work in Korea. I want to mention that there is a new report that is being published by the ILO on employment and social protection in the new demographic context, and it is very likely that it will be the subject of a tripartite discussion in 2012 at the International Labor Conference. So if you're interested, I hope you will continue to contribute to the policy debate and engage in it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Clark? Uh, uh, Dr. Evans uh, talked about the, uh, the ILO's strategies uh, for the skills and development, and uh, secondly, the, uh, what will going to happen in the labor market in the aging society, and thirdly, the the policies to keep older workers productively in the labor market. And we'll have uh, discussions uh, after the presentation ends. Now we'll hear the this presentation of Dr. Lam Char Lee. Oh, you are there already, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lam Char Lee. I'm working in as a fellow. Especially, thank you for chairperson, the Professor Ashley Kim, former Congresswoman. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you know, that uh, currently Korea faces a severe aging crisis. Uh, baby boomers, those who were born between 1955 through 1963, 
are likely to lead the large-scale aging pro, uh, process after 2020s. Aging is a positive aspect of lengthening average life expectation and creating new industry. However, it expedited the fixation of a low growth year caused by negative effects such as capital finance loan. Okay. Today I present about uh, such as process. Uh, chapter two is uh, I explain about the changes of labor market in aging populations, uh, such as the population of the old age people, the composition of the productivity population, and the uh, aging trend, the participation rate of the elderly populations, and unemployment and employment in uh, aging population. Third part is I uh, explain region and impact of aging population. Uh, finally, I suggest alternative policy for aging population uh, presented. Okay, this one. Okay. As you know that uh, Korea is uh, expected to become one of the world's uh, most aged societies over the next 20 years. Senior age 65 over is will account for 38.2% uh, of the nation total population uh, by the next 2050s. The ratio is the first largest among the G20 countries. However, government is not yet prepared to embrace the changing demographic as it is not equipped with an advanced system for the elderly. Okay, this figure shows that the proportion of population and working ages by age groups. According to the National Statistics Office, as of March 2010, the total population in Korea was approximately 49.86 million. It is expected to show a gradual increase in the coming 10 years and reaches 50 million by 2020s. The population composed of those aged over 65 in the total population is forecast to continually increase 38.2%, the right side uh, below, right below right side. The total population of Korea in the 1960, uh, maybe the estimate by uh, statistic in Korea was only the 25.1 million among the productivity populations, uh, no age, no age uh, 15 through 64. This, uh, diagram, uh, this chart shows uh, show the uh, proportion population age 65 over by genders from 1980s through 2030s. Okay. The gender ratio of the population age is 65 over uh, was 6.69.2 6, in 2010. At this focus to reach is uh, 79 point in 20 years by 2030s, as it continues to improve. Maybe the, this mainly because the mortality rate of the male elderly peoples is decreasing with the development of medical technologies and an increased interest in health. Okay, this is skipping. Okay, this one is the uh, explain about the total fertility rate uh, 1970s through uh, 2008. Many economists uh, have been interested in the question of 
Why fertility rate always decline when a country goes through the process of development? The traditional allocation of time provides a conceptual, conceptual framework that suggests that uh, in industrial, industry, industrialized countries, in particular, fertility and female labor force participation will, will, be, will, uh, will likely be uh, inversely related. As you can see, this table is in 1970, that time is the total fertility rate in 4.56. However, this time, maybe that this time is 1.09 or 1.10 years, around 1.20 years in Korea. This shows that pace of the aging by countries, the Japan, France, Germany, UK, Canada, so on. Yeah. What case, what makes Korea aging process is rapid pace, which uh, magnify the potential negative effect and urgency to prepare for them. See? Maybe the, in Korea is this one. Yeah. Okay, sure. Hmm. Okay, this one, yeah. Maybe the 7% mean is the aging society. The aging society mean is the uh, people aged 50, 65 over, uh, over the makeup, over 70%, 7, 7%. Aged, aged society is the 14%. Over 20% is the super aged uh, societies. As you can see, that this uh, table is Korea is the seven uh, percent. Then then is the aging society is 2000 and aged society 2018. Super aged society is the 20, 2026. Also, right side is the year span. The in Korea uh, case, the from seven percent to 14% only the span 18 years. However, in France, 115 years. Also, United States, the U.S. will do it in 73 years. Also, Japan is very long. Maybe the Japan, 24 years. Okay. Maybe the Korea is, uh, will uh, transform. Uh, from being an uh, aged society or uh, super aged societies, from then means the 14 percent to 20 percent. Yeah, in Korea only the uh, eight years. Okay, uh, this uh, table shows that the dependence ratio of the elderly and index of aging uh, from 1990s through 2040s. As can be seen in table, the elderly support ratio of Korea, a representative index indicating the aging of the population structures, was only the, just the uh, 2010 is the 6.1 point, 6.1 yeah. in 1980s. The lowest among OECD member countries. Okay, compare the, uh, the other countries. In 1980s, the times Korea is 6.1, yeah? The support ratio of aged society like France, France is 21.9, yeah? The UK, 23.5 was four, four, four times higher than that of Korea. After 40 years, maybe the 2050s, Korea's elderly support ratio is expected to continue drastically increasing compared with most OECD countries, compared to USA, Japan, UK, France. And finally, by 2050s, 
is expected to be among the highest in OECD countries. The burden of the increasing elderly support ratio uh, will cause pressure of the national financial status uh, due to added strain on elderly social welfare systems such as the national pension, uh, other pension programs, medical insurance, and so on. Causing a decrease of national economic growth, economic growth and expressed as a political conflict among generations. Okay, this one uh, uh, showed that the civilian participation rate of aged over uh, aged 65 years over in OECD countries. In Korea, uh, 2004, only the uh, 29.8. Uh, in 2009, it's the 30.1%. Compared to uh, the other countries, this table shows the uh, proportion of employment compositions by employment status that means the self-employed workers, unpaid family workers, are employed. The employment rate of the elderly in Korea is higher than that of foreign countries. However, this is because there are many self-employed uh, among the elderly, including agriculture sectors. For we can see the self-employed uh, in 2008 is 49.1 percent. This time is uh, uh, maybe the 46.4 percent. So compare the male and the female. It's a very high percentage of the self-employed worker in Korea, especially the aging population. And this one is the, so the level of monthly wage in employment, uh, old aging uh, population. It's scary. These figures uh, show that the changes of the uh, major population and statistics, such as uh, life expectation and total poverty rate and crude death rate, also increasing rate of the population. We can find some part, uh, is, uh, particular parties uh, of increasing rate of the population. Maybe the two, 2030s, the, uh, our uh, population decreased 0.25. Also, in 2050, that times the 1.07, the decreasing. Yeah. This uh, table shows the fertility rate, uh, employment pattern, and labor force participation uh, during the 1970s through 2010. Okay. The Korea is the lowest. Uh, 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 Fertility rate in the world. Okay, now uh, let me explain about the region and impact uh, aging populations. Maybe the, there are many, uh, there are two major reasons why such as a drastic aging process in occurring in Korea. The first is the uh, drastic increase of average life span. If a person, uh, a person was born in 1950, life expectation was less than 50. Maybe I was born in uh, 1957. Maybe this time I should die. Yes. Because 1950, that time the life, life expectation is less than 50. However, uh, uh, in 20, 2000, the average life expectation among males is 72, and that among females, almost 80. Okay, this. Maybe the, in uh, this scheme. Okay, also another reason is the uh, drastic in, uh, decrease of the birth rate. Uh, during the past 20 years, Korea total birth rate has been less than 1.5%. The 
the newborn birth rate in Korea in 2008 was 1.19, the lowest among the OECD countries. Okay. This, this figure, the uh, effect of the aging populations the, in capital market uh, and uh, labor markets. Okay. In uh, labor market, uh, a negative aspect of the aging populations, uh, we can see the, uh, decreasing, the decreasing of labor force. Also, uh, decreasing labor productivity. The other part is the capital uh, market is increasing consumption and decreasing saving, including the uh, investment contraction. Also, a rapid increasing uh, pension and medical expense, especially the deep deficit. Yeah. This one is the, I uh, uh, skip the effect of the worker aspect and the company aspect. So now let me the, suggest the several the, uh, policies the, for aging populations. A policy perspective of the aging populations uh, presents a number of major challenges in Korea. So I suggest uh, one is the political and the other one is the economic risk. In political is the, it might become more difficult to adopt certain policies, such as cutting health and pension benefit. In uh, economic is, there will be increased stress on working population whose tax pay for health budget and pension of their elders. I have several uh, uh, policies. I suggest several policies. The first one is human capital stock rising and increasing the productivity of the old aged people through activity uh, vocational training. The third one is the providing opportunities for lifelong learning, education, and training. Fourth, the measure to use aged manpower. Finally, uh, I suggest increasing the employability of the aged. The human capital stock, first one is the uh, in, uh, human capital stock rising. Yeah? That, means, uh, that means the method of minimizing the adverse effect of aging to the national economy is to increase labor productivity. Okay, this one's key. Second one is the, uh, increasing the productivity of the old age uh, people through the activity vocational trainings. Yeah? One of the most prominent uh, characteristics in Korea's employment structures is that the employment rate of the aged is higher than that in advanced countries and is actually increasing. This will to work among the aged is not necessarily regarded as a positive phenomenon as it uh, stems from a high poverty rate among the elderly due to low asset accumulation, no pension, discipline rate, and social welfare is uh, sufficient. According to the result of an additional uh, survey for the 2009 uh, economic activity census by National Statistics Office, 56.3% 56 of the population aged never received the pension for the first years. Yeah. As there are a number of the pension payment loophole, uh, it's unfortunately that the pension is failing to the provide guaranteed in income in late years. Okay, this one. So one is providing opportunity for lifelong learning education training. Okay. As the correlation between vocational training and employment uh, and wages are uh, high, the establishment of the right from education and training system is emphasized with the advent of the aging societies. Okay, okay uh, first one is the measure to use aged manpower. 
the resolved problem caused by aging, the labor force of the aged and female should be utilized. The reason why we can expect the possibility of the supply of the continuous good quality labor powers is that the old age people uh, with higher education have been increasing at a fast pace. Finally, I suggest the increasing employability of the aged population. It's necessary to increase the efficiency of use of the old ages. And overall society by reorganizing financial capital market to match the population structures, improve the system such as pension problem, uh, early retirement to offset the effect of labor force size decreasing, decrease, and increase the employment and economic activities, partnership, part, participation of the aged, especially female workers, so on. Okay. As the number of the old aged laborers increase, seniority collapse, collapse, and traditional industry inevitably contract. Uh, due to a lack of productivity manpower. With the aging trend, the importance of the service industry, such as medical and recoption industry, so on, uh, increase, affecting the manufacturing, housing, and financial industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nam Cha Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, presented uh, many meaningful statistics and figures of the aging population in Korea. And he examined the regions of the aging population and its impact in Korean labor market. And he suggested the five policies for the aging population, and we'll have discussion on that too. Now, we are going to invite the discussant first, uh, Professor Hyunjung Chun, uh, please. Oh, you're going to, okay, I'll give 10 minutes for you. Thank you for presenting. Uh, 안녕하세요, 전현중입니다. 저는 uh, 대부분의 청중들이 한국 분이기 때문에 자료를 영어로 준비했지만 한국말로 발표를 하도록 하겠습니다. 두 분의 발표를 원고를 잘 읽고 공부하면서 어네 가지 그 부분으로 나누어서 어 생각을 해 봤습니다. 두 분의 발표와 최근에 그 우리나라에서 진행되고 있는 어, 고령 노동자에 대한 고용을 촉진하기 위한 여러 가지 정책들을 생각해 보면서 다음 같은 그림을 그려봤습니다. 에, 일단 그 고령 노동층의 고용을 촉진하기 위해서는 연금 제도와 어, 건강 관리 제도가 그에 대한 기반이 구축이 돼야 된다고 생각합니다. 그 바탕 위에 에, 숙련 스킬을 향상시키는 노력을 통해서 어, 고령 노동자의 에, 고용을 촉진할 수 있다고 생각을 합니다. 예, 그 다음에 그 결과 계속해서 어떤 고령층의 사회적 활동을 촉진하고 자원봉사를 활성화하는 걸 통해서 어, 고령층이 예, 지속적으로 어떤 사회적 활동을 유지할 수 있는 어, 뒷받침이 되도록 하는 것이 좋다고 생각을 합니다. 이를 위해서도 정부가 관련된 여러 가지 정책들을 고안하고 있는 것으로 알고 있습니다. 예, 고령 노동자들의 어떤 그 최근의 추세와 어, 고용과 가, 관계를 살펴보면은 그 이남철 박사님께서 특별히 잘 요약을 해주셨습니다. 어, 수명이 증가하고 어, 출산율이 낮아지고 어, 그다음에 그에 따른 노동력이 감소하는 문제가 생기고 있습니다. 장기적으로 어, 노동력이 부족하고 결국은 연금이나 의료 비용 같은 비용들이 굉장히 증가해서 사회적 부담이 되고 결국은 어, 경제가 성장을 
멈추고 둔화되며 고용이 결국은 어, 나빠지고 특히 고령층 취약계층 중에 하나인 고령층의 고용이 더욱 나빠지는 악순환이 계속되고 있다고 생각을 합니다 다음 그림은 우리나라의 그 70, 그 최근에 고령 인구의 변화의 추세입니다 20, 2030년에는 75세 인구 비율이 약 10%가 전체 인구의 10%가 될 것으로 예상이 되고요 2050년에는 다시 두 배가 되어서 21.5%로 증가해서 앞에서 이남철 박사님이 말씀해 주신 대로 급격한 고령 사회가 진행되는 것으로 예상이 됩니다 관련해서 연금과 의료 관련 비용도 급격히 증가해서 2005년도에는 8명의 그 취업자가 한 분의 고령자를 부양하는 것이 형태였는데요 2020년에는 네 사람이 한 분을 어, 케어를 해야 되고 50년에는 한 사람이 한 사람을 케어해야 되는 그런 그 굉장히 고부담 고령층 사회가 진행이 될 것으로 예상이 됩니다 저희가 지금 최근에 한 연구를 진행하고 있는데요 그 역시 그 고령 노동자들이 어, 각 고용을 생각해서는 고령 노동자 개개인의 특성을 좀 파악할 필요가 있다고 생각합니다 그 최근에 연구에서 보면 은 우리나라 고령 노동자들은 굉장히 비교적 학력이 매우 낮은 것으로 나타났고요 그 다음에 생산성이 굉장히 또 상대적으로 낮은 것으로 나타났습니다 또 더욱 낮아지고 있는 형태로 조사가 되었고요 어, 그 다음에 고령층들은 어떤 복잡한 이나 정규직보다는 단순 노동직을 원하고 있었습니다 어, 시간제 근로라든지 일용직이라든지 저임금 근로를 더 선호하고 있었습니다 에, 그리고 또한 가지 고려해야 될 점은 임금 이외에 여러 가지 요소들을 더 중시하는 것으로 어, 조사가 되었습니다 근무 시간이라든지 출퇴근 시간, 노동의 강도, 근무 여건 이런 것들을 더 임금보다 관심 있게 생각하고 있었습니다 어, 두 분, 이남철 박사님과 그, 어, 에반스 클럽 국장님께서 여러 가지 좋은 제안을 해주셨는데요 제가 그 중요한 것만 정리를 해봤습니다 특히 이남철 박사님께서 제안해 주신 그두 번째 문제에 대해서는 어, 고령 면파워를 이용하기 위한 여러 가지 조치가 마련돼야 된다고 얘기를 했는데요 이를 위해서는 먼저 우리나라 고령 노동층이 어떻게 좀 스타기 어느 정도 되는지 어, 종류가 어느, 어떤 고령 노동층이 존재하고 있는지 이런 현재에 대한 어떤 그 측정 연구가 먼저 어, 면파워에 대한 정확한 현황과 어, 그 스타기에 대한 연구가 먼저 선행돼야 된다고 생각을 합니다. 그다음에 에반스 클락 국장님의 제안 중에서는 어, 특히 두 번째에 저는 굉장히 관심을 많이 가졌습니다. 어, 특히 고용 서비스 부분 최근에 그잡 매칭과 관련해서 굉장히 우리나라에서도 관심이 많은 부분인데요 어, 이 부분은 뒤에서 조금 질문과 함께 또 드리도록 하겠습니다 그 다음에 이제 차별 문제를 말씀해 주셨는데 에, 저는 어, 에반스 국장님의 그 에반스 클락 국장님의 모든 의견에 찬성하지만 어, 부분적으로 또 어, 약간 다른 견해를 가지고 있어서 또 궁금 모르는 부분이 있어서 어, 질문에서 드리도록 하겠습니다 예, 제가 나름대로 몇 가지 소제션을 이제 해봤는데요. 어, 세 번째 특히 어, 고령층 노동자를 위한 잠 매칭이 예, 많이 개선돼야 된다 우리나라 이렇게 생각을 합니다. 우리나라는 이제 그 동안에 소위 그잠 매칭 방법에서 하드 매칭을 방법을 사용했습니다. 정확하게 구인자와 구직자가 조건이 맞아야지 어, 취업이 취업 발생이 성공되는 그런 매칭 방법이었습니다. 그런데 최근에는 서로 원하는 조건이 다르더라도 매칭을 시키는 소프트 매칭 방법들이 많이 도입되고 활성화되고 있습니다. 그런데 이제 고령층들은 어, 실제로 어, 이 정부의 공공 고용 서비스를 퍼블릭 임플로이먼트 서비스를 잘 이용하지 않는 경향이 많고요. 또 특, 어, 일부 계층은 또 신분 노출을 우려해 가지고 어, 공공 서비스를 이용하지 않는 경우가 많습니다. 이런 경우는 이제 비싼 민간 플라이빗 임플로이먼트 서비스를 이용하는데요. 어, 제가 하나 제안 드리는 거는 이제 혹시 뭐 블라인드 잡 매칭, 블라인드 플라스먼트 이렇게 말할 수 있는지 모르지만은 어, 신분을 노출하지 않고 어, 자기가 고용 알선을 받을 수 있는 어, 그런 어떤 그 인터넷이라든가 이런 매체가 발전하면은 
어, 고령층 고용 촉진을 촉, 촉진하는데 굉장히 도움이 되지 않을까 이렇게 생각을 해봤습니다. 그 다음에 이제 제가 말씀드리는 것은 어, 다섯 번째 비임금 고용에 대한 비임금 요소의 개선입니다. 출퇴근 시간의 개선이라든지 근무 환경의 개선 이런 것들을 통해서 고령자의 촉, 고용을 더욱 촉진할 수 있다고 생각합니다. 이들은 임금보다도 이런 임금 외적 요소에 관심이 많기 때문입니다. 마지막으로는 어, 이런 노령층 그 고용을 위해서 고용 촉진을 위해서 관련된 스테이크홀들이 주, 관련 주체들이 네트워크를 형성을 해야 된다고 생각합니다. 정부와 기업과 NGO 이런 관련 분, 분들이 최근에 또 관심이 대상이 되고 있는 사회적 기업과 같은 이런 기업들을 활용해서 노령층 고용을 촉진하기 위해서는 이들의 관계가 굉장히 긴밀하게 에, 형성이 돼야 된다고 생각을 하고요. 그 다음에 지역 차원에 아주 마이크로한 세밀한 네트워크가 구축돼야 된다고 어, 생각을 합니다. 마지막으로 두 분께 짤막한 질문을 드리면서 제 코멘트를 마치도록 하겠습니다. 어, 특히 그 에반스 클락 국장님께서는 어, 여러 가지 그 사회적 통념에 대해서 오해되고 있는 부분에 대해서 지적을 해 주셨는데요. 어, 제 생각에는 어, 그런 부분이 에, 어, 조금 다른 견해도 있을지 않을, 있지 않을까 이런 생각을 해봤습니다. 최근 프랑스에서는 그 정년 연장과 연금 개혁을 통해서 굉장히 사회적 갈등이 일어나고 있는데요. 어, 정년을 2년 60세, 62세로 연장하면 은 어, 청년 일자리가 한 100만에서 150만 정도가 없어진다고 합니다. 제가 정확한 말씀인지는 모르지만요. 에, 그렇다면 은 어, 청년층 노동자의 일자리와 어, 노령층 노동 일자리는 상충관계인가 상호보완관계인가 그 국장님 발표에서는 보안관계라는 말씀을 하셨는데 상당한 부분 또 서로를 침범하는 그런 부분도 있지 않을까 이런 생각을 해봤습니다 그래서 그 사회적 통념 오해는 일부 부분적으로다도 진실이 아닌가 아니면 또 계속되고 있는 부분이 아닌가 이런 질문을 드리고 싶습니다 그리고 이난철 박사님께는 말씀드리고 싶, 질문 드리고 싶은 것은 우리나라 사회가 급격히 고령층이 교육 수준이 높아지고 있어서 그걸 바탕으로 하는 여러 가지 제안들을 해주셨는데 제가 보기에는 현실적으로는 아직도 우리나라 고령층은 교육 수준이 매우 낮은 부분이고 이런 부분들이 그 현대 인터넷이라든가 이런 걸 통해서 직업을 나선 받기가 굉장히 어려운 상황이라고 생각이 됩니다. 그리고 생산성도 교육 수준뿐만 아니라 굉장히 여러 가지 여기서 영향을 받고 있습니다. 그래서 이런 부분들을 다 고려한 좀 고용 촉진을 위한 방법이 혹시 있으신지 이런 질문을 드리고 싶습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you, Professor John. Uh, thank you for your valuable comments and good questions. Now we we'll invite uh, Professor Ki Sung Lee for discussion. Hi, um, my name is Ki Sung, as introduced. Uh, I think I have attended this uh, forum from the beginning year. But uh, the first time I found that uh, many audience and many participants did not use headset, but um, time passes, many uh, participants do not use headset. That means uh, they are already internationalized or they got uh, fully interna internationalized. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's my honor to uh, be invited as a, a discussant to um, two distinguished doctors' uh, presentation. Uh, when I was invited to this uh, forum, I, firstly, I hesitated to accept it or not, because I'm not an economist and even a demographer. <laughs> I do not uh, have a strong interest in uh, changes of uh, you know, uh, population or you know, employability or something. So I, I'm an HR developer, HRD person. So uh, once 
uh, people are employed by an organization or companies, uh, what trains or developments needed to uh, uh, are required to for them is my main interest. So, uh, firstly, I um, I would like to turn this chance to some of my friends, but uh, finally I accept it. Uh, so I uh, give some uh, chunk idea instead of uh, uh, s- developing old aged people, I mean aged people, instead using, utilizing their skills. Uh, well, I will uh, mention it again later. Mm. Uh, firstly, Dr. Lee uh, enumerated uh, some gloomy forecasts in many points, such as the rapid increase of a proportion of aged population, pace of aging, um, the rank of a dependency ratio among the major developed countries, etc. We can tell at a glance what is worse is that um, their employment composition doesn't seem awful in that only 14% of employees is regular workers out of 41% of the whole employee. That means um, if we retire, um, we need to think about um, uh, decent job is not prepared for the retired person. Uh, Dr. Lee explained that sustained low uh, fertility, increased of life expectancy, and so on, are the causes of these undesirable projections. And also, he named some negative aspects of aging population, namely increasing consumption and decreasing savings, rapid increasing of pension and medical expenses, decreasing of labor force and decreasing of labor productivity. And finally, it continues to decrease of uh, potential growth, um, as is shown on one of the, um, his PowerPoint slide. He suggested some policy for aging population. I would like to agree on his perspective and views. But as a human resource developer, I want to suggest one important idea. Uh, that is, we need to differentiate aged population into developable and undevelopable. You know, are these words workable or not? Developable and undevelopable. From an HRD viewpoint, I would like to say once human resources are developed, they need to be utilized. So we don't need to invest lots of the financial resources to develop old people. Instead, we need to find out how to utilize them, especially their work experiences, their skills, and um, if possible, their wisdom too. You know, we, uh, some of an old Western saying that is, uh, frequently uh, quoted by HR developers, do not teach an old dog a new trick. Do not teach an old dog a new trick. That means do not provide new skills to old people. Right? I think um, the last part is hidden. Do not teach an old dog a new trick. Instead, we need to utilize its trick. Does it make sense? Right? So uh, we need to think about that. And um, I will go over to uh, Dr. Evans Clark's paper. As for her paper, I might not understand Uh, what she wants to say, because I don't have her uh, full text. 
but I will try to give my comment to her paper. I wish I would not distort her idea. She provided skills development from the international organization's point of view. It means that her paper used a macro perspective approach, not focused on country specific, but world general. Dr. Evans Clark emphasizes that shared responsibilities on skill development between governments and social partners. She mentioned that social partners that take responsibilities on further training and workplace learning and training, which can be reusable for a community and even industry when they retire. They, and it will boost virtuous circle in terms of skill usage. She pointed out the way how to use all the workers. Her idea was to utilize them as trainers for mentoring younger workers. I think that is a very good idea. So I agree to her idea. Even though there is a limitation that we don't need that many mentors for train young workers. You know. Uh, and also, there is some uh, financial problems to reward the mentors, too. I found that her paper didn't focus on all the workers only, but she dealt with youth, and people living in rural areas, women, disabled persons, etc. From a macro approach, each country needs to be careful if the policy suggestion is an appropriate policy for the country. Overall, I think that she suggested reasonable strategies for maintaining employability of older workers, and I also agree to the three major implications for skills and training. However, when certain countries adopt her suggestions on training, employment service, combating discrimination, they need to be very careful. Because however good an idea may be, it cannot be directly applied to another context. In that context, we need to remind some of our oriental old saying too. When a tangerine is transplanted in northern area, it will bear a trifolite, trifoliate orange. Okay. Uh, I think um, uh, that's all I prepared. So. I will close my uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee gi Now, we will turn the mic to the two speakers. Uh, we will hear the reply to the questions and comments of the discussants. So, would you please, uh, Dr. Evans Club, would you please uh, reply to them? You have received their questions and comments. Well, thank you very much. Those are very insightful comments, um, and I think particularly interesting to um, apply as you did, looking at international experience and looking. What of that is particularly relevant or not so relevant to specific experience um, that you have been explaining here in Korea? Um, there was a question about uh, employment services, and I appreciate the comment that private employment agencies are certainly important actors in, in the job matching and in providing services. Um, the ILO's position on private employment agencies is that they are important mediators in the labor market and they merit uh, regulation by governments uh, to ensure that the private employment agencies carry out uh, uh, their work in line with public policies. And so in particular uh, about not discriminating against uh, people that they try to help find jobs and that would be uh, relevant to our issue this morning, this afternoon on, on older workers as well. Um, we know that in many places, most places, there is a large need for public employment services so that these important mediation services can be available to everyone. Um, this is what helps the labor market work efficiently and fairly for workers. 
And so these services should not be available only to those who can afford to pay for them. Um, and then leaving uh, the harder to place uh, workers for the public employment services. So there, there's lots of opportunity for a good partnership um, between public and private employment services. I think another major question was about this, this question, um, really a difficult policy issue in many countries, about should policies uh, promote employment opportunities for youth should they promote employability for older workers? And I think we need to look at this issue from the perspectives that I've tried to mention on both productivity and fairness, um, that not all older workers uh, wish to remain active in the labor market. Um, we are thinking about those who choose to try to stay employed and how to ensure that that employment is productive, uh, that they have access to, to training, that will maintain their productivity in the labor market. I think there was an important point raised about um, how this whole issue reinforces uh, the importance of lifelong learning, uh, that it's going to be that much more difficult to train those of us when we're older if we haven't done any further training since we left school as young people. So there's certainly an emphasis there on how public policy can create a conducive environment and public-private partnerships for the private sector to continue investing in training, that this has a return to the company in terms of their productivity, but also return to individuals in terms of their employability. Um, the research that I mentioned that looked at the possible trade-offs emphasized that, there, that older workers are leaving uh, more likely to be leaving declining industries or declining occupations, and that this is not the same kind of training and preparation that young people need. So it's, it's not easy or simple to see the trade-offs between looking at older workers and younger workers. I think the bottom line is that if countries that have aging societies want to avoid labor market shortages, that they need to follow the dual approach to make sure that young people can be productively, gainfully employed, and that older workers can stay in the labor market as they wish to do so. Um, and this is the, the, the trade-offs there, I think, are, are quite rightly, there is no one right answer to that question. It needs to be decided by societies themselves, and it's so important uh, for social dialogue to take place across generations, uh, between employers and employees, and between levels of government for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Lee. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee and Professor Jones. Maybe the Professor Lee's the comment, uh, complimentary comment, yeah? Uh, also, uh, Professor Jones asked uh, two questions. Uh, even though uh, year of education is not high in Korea's uh, age, aging populations, I agree these times. Uh, according to the 2005 census, uh, the population with a university education were more aged, 60 through 64. That time is uh, only 1.9%. At the ages the 40 through 44, the ratio increased to 8.9%. At age 30 through 34, the ratio of 18 percent. Then, minister uh, is improved of education attainment in the future in Korea, especially the aging populations. The other question is uh, uh, about the producti productivity of aging population is not high. Yeah? Okay. This time, I cannot say uh, uh, extremely easy because the I individual uh, views the. Characteristics, personal characteristics, characteristics are whole different in Korea. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, it's over 2.20, uh, but I'll extend the time about 10 minutes uh, for the discussion. So I'll open discussion for, okay, for the floor, I'll open the discussion. So. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question or comment? 
Oh, yes. Okay. Would you please identify yourself and to whom you are directing the question? My name is KJ and working for a, uh, a child consulting company. My question to Kristen about uh, uh, with regard to combating discrimination of uh, using aging labels. Uh, actually, uh, as a part of a, a CSR activity, our companies now promote uh, employment of aging population, which means uh, we actually recommend some retired executives uh, who used to work for a large corporations like Samsung and uh, Hyundai and LG, and then uh, is recommended to medium, small and medium-sized company who, who require you know, skilled executives. Conceptually, they are uh, uh, very receptive to the concept, but nevertheless, in reality, uh, the owner of the SMEs is uh, skeptical hired to, to hiring you know, aged people. Uh, the one major reason seniority based uh, the organization culture. If I hire as an owner of the company, if I hire uh, elder people, you know, who happen to be older than me, I would be very uh, incompatible to, uh, to uh, manage, you know, these people. So uh, my question to Christian is, you know, uh, I just would like to know whether you have any similar experience in other developed countries, you know, when uh, promoted this, uh, the hiring aging people. And then uh, if yes, you know, what are the efforts the, these countries uh, made to, to educate, you know, such uh, employers? Yes. Thank you very much. I think you raised a, a very important point that I, I failed to mention is, is that a good opportunity for older workers themselves if they are displaced in companies is entrepreneurship, isn't it, to capitalize on their own experience and instead of only looking for wage employment to also think about becoming entrepreneurs. So that's one aspect and I appreciate your comment about corporate social responsibility, um, including this aspect of discrimination. I think your harder question is about the social issues involved in, in hiring older workers. We tend to focus on hard skills and training as answers to, to Paula's to social questions, but I think you've rightly raised that in many societies, um, it is difficult for an older worker to report to a younger person and for a younger person to know how to respectfully provide guidance and manage an, an older worker. Um, and, and these are things that we need to recognize. I think uh, you've partly answered your own question by looking at, at good examples, at mentors, at advertising, publicizing good examples. I think there's, there's ways of respecting what older workers can contribute, as you were saying, in wisdom, as well as technical uh, economic inputs uh, that can make a working environment very comfortable and can have a lot of, of non-economic value for, for the company, the enterprise, and, and the younger workers. So I think it is an issue to deal with, and there, I think the best way is, is to have these kinds of open conversations about that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? No. Oh, there, yes. Uh, Yon Kim Farish University. So, uh, I might have missed some of the pre presentations because I came in late, but I wondered whether uh, face out, face in possibilities have been considered. Aged, uh, many countries, they do have retirement age. Many cases, mandatory, say 58, 60. But in expanding uh, lifespan, 58, 60 is still very young, so that Facing out all the workers, those who are fit to work, willing to work, facing out the retirement for over five years, even seven, ten years, and younger people face in because many younger people, company employs them, 
and have six months uh, training and internship and one, up to one year. So for younger people, facing in gradually so that they gain full employment after a year or whatever it takes necessary. All the people facing out a longer period of time, that may reduce the burden of retraining all the people. Thank you. Would you like to answer? No? Okay. <clears throat> uh, we are running out of time, but I have prepared one question for Dr. Evans' club. Okay. My question is the participant rate of formal education in Korea is at the highest level in the world, but the participation rate of lifelong education in Korea is very, very low. Uh, the <coughs> stati <coughs> excuse me. Uh, statistics says uh, the lifelong education participation rate of Finland is 64.8, Denmark 60%, Sweden 59%, UK 53%, USA 49%, but Korea uh, is 28% only. Uh, since uh, you have been working at the ILO for 10 years, I think you have a lot about, you know a lot about each country's policies and the impact of the policies on the labor market. Could you say something about the major skills and development policies and strategies of countries with a high participation rate of lifelong education and the empirical results of policies in those countries? I'll try to say something that's a very large question, I'm afraid. Um, I, I noticed the countries that you compared statistically are very interesting. Um, and I think that it's not all a good story. I think in my country, the United States, there is such high turnover among workers as opposed to the tradition in Korea where there's been more of a tradition of lifelong employment. Um, and workers who do not count on being employed in the same industry or the same company throughout until they retire, perhaps have more incentive to participate in training, to look for further training, because they have less job security. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but, it, but we have to look at um, training take-up, um, training participation in the broader context of labor market conditions. Um, and where there is, uh, where the culture or the practice is to keep employees longer, there's of course more incentive to learn on the job for employers to invest because they get the, the return. And where there is less likelihood of lifetime employment in the same company, um, there is less, of course, incentive to invest in training for your employees, and therefore employees may look outside. So it's difficult to measure lifelong learning at the workplace because so much of it is not in formal courses, um, and, and yet I think we should not discount the kind of learning that takes place on an ongoing way um, and that is probably not completely reflected in these statistics. I think where we see good uptake of lifelong learning, it's where their companies have, are changing, that they're vibrant, they're innovative, and they see the need to keep uh, up to date in skills. I think it's where we see public-private partnerships, that governments see that there is a public benefit to ongoing training, as well as the private benefit to workers and employers. And they find ways to help share the costs uh, so that training is beneficial to society as well as to the individuals. I think we see this happening more where there is effective institutions of social dialogue and happening less um, where we don't see it. Um, so maybe that's a, a shorter answer than you would like, but I think it's, it's a very good question and, and, and merits a, quite a lot of reflection. Thank you. Oh, it's about the time that we have to finish the session. Um, before closing, I would like to thank the two speakers and the discussants and all the participants in this session. Uh, 
we'll close the session. Um, let's give a speak and to all of us, okay?